let's talk about permanence. Or more specifically, what isn't permanent. The word impermanent comes, unsurprisingly, from permanent, which comes from Middle French or possibly directly from Latin. In that ancient context, we find that it meant remaining. In less than 20 minutes, this sermon will no longer remain. In less than an hour, the service will no longer remain. In a day, this Sunday will no longer remain. You're probably thinking that this is pretty obvious, and in a way, that's true. In each individual case, the question was pretty self-evident, but if we were to ask what exactly demarcates the line between temporary and permanent, it becomes feverishly difficult. Because a lot of ideas that today seem timeless are actually quite contemporary. For hundreds of years, career was a word used exclusively to, to describe racehorses. For longer still, the word ambition was more of an insult than a compliment. And the sanctity of childhood and the idea that parents are there to support children and not the other way around has only existed for about a century. We certainly cannot rely on our intuition here. Is there anything truly transcendent of time? Is there anything actually constant? Is there anything that will always remain? Before we get too far into this question, let's back up and ask a slightly different question. Why is the infinite considered so important? Why do we put things that are permanent on such proud pedestals? Perhaps because, as humans, the idea of something existing beyond our boundaries, our mortality, is inherently superhuman and therefore admirable. Actually, considering that infinite things are going to last forever, it becomes very clear that we're talking, what we're talking about here is not only superhuman, but perfect. Something we can always count on to do what it does. This is a very philosophical way to look at perfection, which Paul was probably trying to aim for, for he was writing to Greeks who generally enjoyed that sort of thinking. On the other hand, as a philosopher would be quick to interject, it's important that some things are impermanent. Things that are perfect are incapable of change. If everything were perfect, nothing would get done. And Paul agrees. In describing change, he says that when he became an adult, he outgrew his childish ways. He takes a certain pride in having overcome his childishness, of having changed and grown. Personally, I don't feel like I haven't completely outgrown my childish ways, but I know the feeling. It's pretty cool, and I hope Dan gets to feel it someday. <laughs> but having digressed, we come back to the original question. And as abstract as it seems, the question of impermanence is incredibly weighty in our modern society. The capitalist positive feedback loop from production to profit to research to back to production can't go on increasing forever. We don't have infinite resources. The environment certainly isn't permanent either. And we haven't been doing a lot to slow down its degradation. In many cases, a mixed mischief of ignorance and malice has contrived to speed the end of the beauty of life on this precious rock that we all call home. In this passage, Paul is telling us what we can and can't count on. We can't count on speech, for someday we will run out of things to be said. We can't count on prophecies, for the entire point of a prophecy is to end. We can't count on knowledge, for knowledge is a tool, and tools grow obsolete. As stated, these things will fade. But as our sight through that dim mirror becomes clearer and clearer, so too shall our understanding of the permanence of three things, love, faith, and hope, the greatest of these being love. And these three, Paul affirms, we can't count on. Now my friend Jeremy over here just used a lot of big words. He asked a couple existential questions and he even made a crack at my expense. But the main point of what he was saying is that everything ends. Now I know that that's really depressing to hear. At this point you're probably thinking, why is this kid standing up here and just trying to bum me out? What's the point of coming? 
But bear with me, there is a method to the madness. Now, we all know that things end. Now, that really has never been more prevalent to me than at this time in my life. At this point, I'm right on the precipice between childhood and adulthood. Senior year is full of lasts. As of now, I've had a last first day of school, a last rally day here at church, and this entire year revolves around my last year of living with my parents. It's simultaneously bewilderingly exciting and depressingly awful. Throughout the college search process, my parents have consistently said to have fun with it. They said that they recognize how important it is, but that, that, that the overall process is supposed to be fun. Now, I don't mean to disagree with Cliff and Pepper Peel, but to me, that was a load of baloney. <laughs> this process has been a long cycle of essay after essay, application after application, all circled around the idea that this is an entirely new stage of my life. Senior year, high school, old friendships, for Pete's sake, seeing my family every day. All that will end soon in favor of something completely unknown. And quite frankly, that's terrifying. Now, people say that their college years are their best times. My parents say a lot that they would go back to college in a heartbeat. Now, of course, I'm looking forward to experiencing that for myself, but there's still that underlying fear of the unknown and the, and the desire to stay with what I'm comfortable. There's a desire to not want the things that I know to end. Now, contrary to what you may be thinking, my part of the sermon wasn't just an opportunity for me to rant about my college process. Although, if you'd like to hear about that, just find me after the service. I'd be more than happy to talk your ear off. Now, we all know the old saying. When one door closes, another one opens. That's essentially the main theme of what Jeremy and I and this verse are saying. All human things end. Knowledge, language, prophecy. But God's love, God's complete eternal love, doesn't. That's what this whole thing has been about. Like the verse says, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. It's a contrast between the completeness of God, God's love and the impermanence of everything else. But what's really interesting to me about the verse is that it sounds like God's love prompts the disappearance of the rest. Now, the way I pictured it when I first read this verse was like Michael Jordan stepping on a basketball court and everyone else saying, well, we might as well give up now. God's love is that one exception to the impermanence. God's love is the catalyst that shows the impermanence in the rest. But that impermanence isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because when the impermanence is shown, when things end, then we open ourselves to the complete impermanent love of God. So, what Dan was saying is God's love is permanent. But it never, doesn't always feel that way, as I'm sure you all can feel. Love comes to people in different ways. Love takes different forms to different people. In this passage, Paul says the words patient and kind is used to describe love. Sure, saying love is kind and patient is easy to say, but if you really dissect these words, it's a complicated uh, phrase. Patient and kindness, what does it mean? According to merriamwebster.com, patient means able to remain calm and not become annoyed when waiting for a long time or when dealing with problems or difficult people. And kindness means indulgent, considerate, or helpful, humane. So how can you use these definitions to describe love? An example of kind love is maybe spending your money to pay food for a hungry stranger. And when it comes to patience, well, about four months ago, 
I wouldn't have understood at all what this passage was trying to convey. For the past year, I've been struggling with major depressive disorder, or known as depression. I had no energy or strength to even get out of bed. I cut myself out of all activities that I loved. I even stopped going to youth group because I thought everyone's out to get me, so to speak. <laughs> I really did believe there was no love left in the world, especially not for me. Though as down as I was, there was only one thing that helped me keep the tiniest bit of hope. That was my parents. Some days were worse than others. On those really bad days, they let me stay home from school. I remember one time I was having the worst anxiety attacks of my life. And my parents said, you know, forget school, let's go to breakfast. We went to IHOP, and I think that was the first time I really smiled in about six months or so. I knew my parents were scared and didn't know how it helped me, but they stayed strong for me, but didn't put on a fake smile. That night, we cried together and we hugged. My dad said, we'll get through this. I don't know how, but God has a path for everyone and we'll get through this. Not once did either of my parents say, you have to get through this. It was always we. They showed me what patient love really was. We haven't gone through all of it. There will always be obstacles, but I'm not special. Everyone has their times when they feel like there is no hope. I'm still climbing the ladder to being okay again. And I'll probably never stop. No one really does. If I were in this situation five months ago, I probably wouldn't even be at church today, let alone giving a sermon. And I'll tell you what, I'm happy I went through all of that. I've changed for the better. I see life in a whole new perspective. After feeling like I lost everything, I can now see everyone's love and how they were next to me the whole entire time. But not just during when my depression was really bad, but before then, when everything was exactly the same, I was too blind to see. I took for granted all of the simple gifts I was given and never said thank you. I took advantage of my parents they were always by my side, but only recently have I learned they are truly special people and have gone so close to them in the past month. I learned my church family is also right next to me. I always felt that I was different from everyone else, but then I realized everyone is different, and that's okay. I figured out who I tr truly am. I am a survivor of God's test of love and I truly understand how love can truly be patient and kind. We all have times when we don't feel loved and don't feel God, but even when we don't feel it or too blind to see it, God love really is there. Paul tells us that love can come in many forms and can be shown in a number of ways. For example, love is present in kindness, but is also present in anger. Love may even be present when we think it's not. Love is endless and has no boundaries. But the one thing that surprises me the most about love has become the most apparent to me in these past few weeks. So sometimes in order for something good to happen, something bad must happen first. Most of the time, we learn from our hardships that we go through and they end up making us a better person and teach us things about not only our life, but about ourselves. And that is exactly how I've come to realize just how crazy, mysterious, and inspiring love actually is. So, as many of you may know, um, I recently lost my grandmother from a battle with cancer. Uh, she was someone who definitely kept you on your toes. She was extremely stubborn that runs in the family. Um, she was helpful to everyone, but most of all, she was extremely loving, and she had such a loving personality that reflected onto all the people that she touched in her life. She always wanted to be taking pictures of us grandchildren, even though she didn't know how to work the camera on her flip phone. 
Um, but that just proved to me how much she loved us because she just wanted to be in that moment and treasure those memories. And me being her first grandchild and the obvious favorite, um, <laughs> I have always felt close, very close to her. Um, I never had the chance to forget how much she cared about me because she never gave me that chance. Every chance she got, she would tell me how proud of me she was and what an amazing woman I had turned out to be. One of the days that I had spent with her in the hospital, I was just standing in the, against the wall, just kind of chilling, and she looked up to me and said, Haley, you are so gorgeous. And that just really struck me hard because um, even when she had every reason to be worrying about herself, she was still letting me know what I meant to her. So I'm not trying to say that there are not other people in my life that love me and she's the only one, but her love for me is different than my mom's love for me or even my other grandmother's love for me. And that's when I realized that every person in our lives loves us in a different and unique way that no one else can match. Even though I'm surrounded by people that love me, no one can ever replace that unique love that my grandma had for me. Yes, love comes in forms, in many forms, but it is also different for every person. I believe that every person in our lives leaves us with a matchless impression of their love for us. This is God's way of helping us to understand how complex love is and it shows us just exactly what we have to look forward to when we have our chance to sit at the table with God. Every person in our lives and the impression that they leave on us shows God's love, a reflection of God's perfect, permanent love. There's an impermanence that is inherent in all worldly things. But that impermanence, that ending, opens the door to the complete love of God. This love is all-including, all-knowing, and here ending. And this love is what gets us closer to God and one another. Amen.